I am Demonis. Jesus is my king. You are my family. Hello, I am Demonis. Thank you for joining. Earlier this week, we had America's favorite crusty old Republican, John McCain, again trying to make waves. To refuse the obligations of international leadership and our duty to remain the last best hope of Earth for the sake of some half-baked, spurious nationalism cooked up by people who would rather find scapegoats than solve problems. You heard what he people, said yesterday, people, uh, Senator McCain. Yeah, well, I, I, I hear it, and people have to be careful because at some point I fight back. Yeah. You know, I'm being very nice. I'm being okay. very, very nice. So not only did John McCain have that to say, which was an affront to essentially anyone who voted for Trump and who believes in America first or uh, that we shouldn't really be uh, trying to uh, build governments around the world, which is what John McCain stands for. But not only did he do that, he also took other jabs at the president, one of which was talking about bone, to, uh, bone spur uh, deferrals. Uh, so, so McCain said, one aspect of the conflict, by the way, that I will never ever countenance is that we drafted the lowest income level of America and the highest income level found a doctor that would say that they had a bone spur. That is wrong. That is wrong. If we're going to ask every American to serve, every American should serve. Now, this isn't the first time that there was a squabble between uh, John McCain and now President Trump in any, by any means. The most notable was on the campaign trail when uh, Donald Trump made... Uh, which, you know, when you see it here on the screen, Trump lashes out at McCain. I like people that weren't captured. It sounds so terrible, right? But when you watch the video, which we're going to do, it's actually quite a funny interchange. And you call him a dummy. Is that appropriate in running for president? Okay. Uh, let's, you got to let me speak, though, Frank, because you yeah. interrupt all the time, okay? Yeah. 15,000 people showed up to hear me speak, bigger than anybody, and everybody knows it. A beautiful day with incredible people that were wonderful, great Americans, I will tell you. John McCain goes, oh boy, Trump makes my life difficult. He had 15,000 crazies show up, crazies. He called them all crazy. I said, they weren't crazy. They were great Americans. These people, if you would have seen these people, you, I know what a crazy is. I know all about crazies. <laughs> these weren't crazy. So he insulted me, and he insulted everybody in that room. He hit me. He's not a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war Five hero. And a half years He's a war he hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Do you agree with that? He's a war hero because he was captured, okay? You can have, and I believe perhaps he's a war hero, but, but right now he said some very bad things about a lot of people. Hopefully a lot of Americans are starting to realize that when Trump makes a, a statement that's pretty outlandish, he's really trying to get people interested in that topic and dig into the backgrounds, the background of what he's referring to. So he says something that's very, very uh, harsh sounding. But if you really research it and get into it, you realize he's trying to get you to think about something and to think about, uh, to, to really learn yourself Maybe we should start with how great a veteran is John McCain. Uh, we're going to get into some things here that what Trump is really getting at, but let's let's first talk about like how great a serviceman was he. Now this is um, the L.A. Times. This is from 2008. McCain's mishaps in the cockpit. John McCain was training in his 86 Skyrider over an overcast Texas morning in 1960 when he slammed into Corpus, Corpus Christi Bay and sheared the skin of the plane's wings. McCain recounted the accident decades later in his autobiography. Engine quit while I was practicing landings, he wrote, but an investigation aboard the Naval Aviation Safety Center found no evidence of engine failure. The 23-year-old junior lieutenant wasn't paying attention and erred in using a power setting too low to maintain level flight in a turn, investigators concluded. The crash was one of three early in McCain's aviation career in which his flying skills and judgment were faulted or questioned by Navy officials. 
This guy couldn't fly. This is an article from Rolling Stone back when McCain was trying to run for president. <laughs> I love their subtitle. Bottom gun. Right? In the cockpit. McCain was not a top gun or even a middling gun. He took little interest in his flight manuals. He had, manuals, he had other priorities. Uh, this is from McCain's own words. I enjoyed the off-duty life of Navy Flyer more than I enjoyed the acu actual flying. I drove a Cordette, dated a lot, spent all my free hours at bars and beach parties. They mentioned the Chris Corpus Christi Bay experience, and uh, a little more detail, too. It says when he came through, too, the plane was underwater, and he had to swim to the surface to be rescued. Some might take such a near-death experience as a wake-up call. McCain took some painkillers and a nap and went out carousing that same night. One of the other times, off-duty on his Mediterranean tours, McCain frequented the casinos of Monte Carlo. Flying over the south of Spain one day, he decided to deviate from his flight plan. Rocketing along mere feet above the ground, his plane sliced through a power line. His self-described daredevil clowning plunged much of that area into a blackout. And it goes on here, you know, remarks from others about his career in, in that if that had happened to anyone else, they would have been, you know, swabbing decks on a, on a destroyer or something like that. They would have lost their wings. But God, he had family pool. He was directly related to the C CEO, you know. So McCain, and I don't know how many people know this, McCain was the son of an admiral, who himself was the son of an admiral. So this was a guy, uh, descended of royalty, if you will, or military royalty. This is why he was able to continue flying and continue crashing. He goes on to talk about in 1964, he began a serious romance with a, with a model. Uh, that December, McCain crashed again. Flying back from Philadelphia, where he had joined uh, in the reverie of the Army-Navy football game, McCain stalled while coming in for a refueling stop in Norfolk, Virginia. This time he managed to bail out at 1,000 feet. As his parachute deployed, his plane thundered into the trees below. By now, however, McCain's flying privileges were virtually irrevocable, and he knew it. On one of his runs at McCain Field, when ground control put him on a holding pattern, Lieutenant Commander once again pulled his family's rank. Let me land, McCain demanded over his radio, or I'll take my field and go home. So do you start to get the picture of who McCain really is? Uh, he's hiding behind a career that may not be as shiny and golden as he makes it out to be and what it would immediately th seem to be. Yeah, he's a veteran. Awesome. We respect veterans, and we do, and I want to make this clear. I'm not trying to uh, attack all veterans here, and I don't think Trump was actually trying to attack all veterans when he said, um, I like people who are captured. I think he knows exactly about Mr. McCain's career, and it was a direct attack on McCain, just like McCain was directly attacking him the other day about the bone stir bone spur comment because Trump got a uh, deferral from service for a bone spur. But let's get back to, he's a veteran, right? Veterans must love John McCain. Well, apparently not because there is a, a site actually, McCainBetraysPOWs.org. Um, several years ago, production began on the award-winning documentary film, Missing Presumed Dead, The Search for America's POWs. Uh, having a high de degree of respect for former Vietnam POW Senator John McCain, the producers were shocked to find extreme animosity towards Senator McCain by nearly all the POW MIA activists, advocates, family members, veterans, conservative politicians, and former POWs they had interviewed. Senator McCain seemed to be one of the people that was an obstructionist, who was not interested in the truth coming out. Um, who tried to attack people rather than learn what they had to say. No instance would he ever, ever give in and say there were POWs left behind. And my first question is how would he know or not know? So just that which is reasonable he never exhibited, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's a guilt complex. Maybe he promised the Vietnamese something. Okay, maybe, I don't know what it is. Uh, and maybe he actually believed that. 
That would be the saddest of all. I mean, he was yelling and screaming at me and had me in tears. So let's take a look at when he did put this woman into tears. Let's, let's take a look at that. She was representing the National Alliance of Families, representing families of POWs and MIAs at a special Senate Collect Committee on POW MIA Affairs. This was in 1991 to 93, uh, was when the special commission was trying to find evidence of POWs. But as most people research this and most people who are involved trying to actually get people home and get evidence out, really McCain, Senator Kerry, and all the people that were involved or had the governing control of that committee were really just trying to shut it all down. ...that you have made that are patently and totally false and deceptive to the American people, especially, especially your allegation that, the, that what was achieved by the recent agreement with the Vietnamese as being uh, a fiasco, etc., etc., as you were uh, quoted in the media, uh, is, of course, patently false as well. Now, I've, I'd like to finish, Ms. Alphonse, I'd like you to direct the, the witness to let me finish, uh, Mr. Chairman. And the fact is, Ms. Alphonse, that according to General Vesey, a man who served 46 years in the United States military, received a battlefield commission at age 17, worked up to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, viewed, and the President's emissary to Vietnam, viewed this as a significant breakthrough in his view, not mine, his view, a man whose credentials are unimpeachable, even by someone like you, I find insulting to him and the efforts that he has made for all these years as President's emissary. Now, you are entitled to your opinions, you are entitled to your views, you get them aired frequently, and, th and, and, that's, and that's entirely appropriate in our society. But for you to say, for you to allege to, the, to uh, families who, are, who, who I happen to know, whose long nightmare is over, who's finally over after 20 years, the wife of an, of an Air Force major that I recently talked to, that this means nothing, of course, it's an outrageous insult, not only to them, but their family. This goes on, and it's brutal. It is brutal what this man does to this person who doesn't have another chance to talk until, I think it's like three minutes later. Four minutes later. Shepard, I wish you every success in your next trip to Vietnam on Saturday. Thank you. May I just make one comment? Yeah, one, one for the comment. Please. I, get to the other uh, I didn't bring up the issue of General Crowcroft or General Vesey. I asked, I said this information has come to me, and I'm asking if it's true. And I That's would like to answer is what I'm asking. And family members have waited a long time. We respect the fact that the Senate Select Committee has come a long, long way compared to all the other committees that have been in the past. We're just concerned, as you just mentioned, well, it's the executive branch now. You are our representative. How are we going to impress upon the executive committee that this is important to us? Yes. May I say, Mr. Chairman, that Mrs. Alphonse's remarks in her written statement are far stronger than what she just alleged. Quote, the recent 4,800 photograph fiasco is yet another example of committee duplicity. I'd like you to tell that to some of the families who have finally had this nightmare ended, Mrs. Alphonse. I'd like I've you to tell it to them. I've been speaking to them, sir. No, I've been speaking to no, them. No, I've been talking to them, and they are grateful, and they are happy. And this is, a, this is a, in the view of most experts, a significant breakthrough. Now, when you call it a fiasco and committee duplicity, then you and I have strong disagreement, Ms. Alphonse. Sir, it was not the fiasco of the four or whatever remains came back or information on remains. The fiasco was the people that stepped out and said, we have written the end, the final chapter to Vietnam. That, that was in the statement the first day. The final chapter is coming to its end, and we have not even come close to the final chapter of Vietnam, World War II, Korea, or the Cold War. So the question I have is, why would a 
POW, a former POW, have such animosity for people trying to find out if people were left behind. Why would this be? It makes no common sense. And of course, I'm not the only one who's ever asked that. Why has John McCain blocked info on MIAs? The war hero has long sought to bury information about POWs left behind in Vietnam. John McCain, who has risen to polit political prominence on his image as a Vietnam POW war hero, has inexplicably worked very hard to hide from the public stunning information about American prisoners in Vietnam who, unlike him, didn't return home. Throughout his Senate career, McCain has quietly sponsored and pushed into federal law a set of prohibitions that keep the most revealing information about these men buried as classified documents. Thus, the war hero people would logically imagine to be a determined crusader for the interests of POWs and their families became instead the strange champion of hiding the evidence and closing the books. Perhaps you've never heard of the term Songbird McCain. This was what he was called by many who are against him, who have a different side of his story. Now, a lot of people don't know, and I'll give you links here. You can read it all yourself. But the summary is McCain was flying his plane in, over Vietnam, over Hanoi. His plane was shot down. It crash-landed into a lake. He broke both of his arms and one of his legs. And his account is that although they broke him, he did not divulge true secrets, uh, true American secrets. He divulged falsehoods. And that when he was given the ability to be released ahead of other prisoners who had been there longer, he had followed military code and stayed longer. Now, the counter theory is that this is Songbird McCain, that he sung like a bird, under captivity. Let's look at Songbird McCain, the evidence in his own words, his fellow veterans, and as captors. McCain had a unique POW experience. Initially, he was taken to the infamous Hanoi Hilton prison camp where he was interrogated. By McCain's own account, after three or four days, he cracked. He promised his Vietnamese captors, I'll give you military information if you will take me to the hospital. His Vietnamese captors soon realized that their POW, John Sidney McCain III, came from a well-bred line of American military elites. McCain's father, John Jr., and grandfather, John Sr., were both full admirals. According to one source, McCain's collaboration may have had very real consequences. Retired Army Colonel Earl Hopper, a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, contends that the information that McCain divulged was classified and North Vietnam used it to hone their air defense system. McCain told his North Vietnamese captors highly classified information, the most important of which was the package routes, which were routes used to bomb North Vietnam. He gave in detail the altitude they were flying, the direction, if they made a turn, he gave them what primary targets the United States were, was interested in. And because of this, the information that McCain gave him, in 1968, we called off the bombing of North Vietnam from one of his captors. But I can confirm to you that we never tortured him. We never tortured any prisoners. Mr. Doyette reminisces instead about how he often summoned the future U.S. presidential candidate to his private office for informal chats. He did not tell the truth. But I can somehow sympathize with him. He lies to American voters in order to get their support for his presidential election. John McCain is the longtime senator from Phoenix, Arizona. And the Phoenix New Times last year uh, published this article, John McCain's purported Vietnam War uh, proper propaganda recording released by far-right internet radio host. Now they go in here, go on in here to try and really slam uh, the site that released it and and make all kind of disparaging things and that the video, the, the audio might not be really real. They, they insinuate that. But if you scroll all the way down, 
So we scroll down, there's finally you get to the update. It says, the National Archives in Washington, D.C. emailed the New Times two audio files of broadcasts made by North Vietnamese radio during the war, both of which use a recording of McCain's voice. One of them apparently contains the clip published by True News. So I think we can see here that what you're about to hear is authentic. This audio recording was found in a misplaced file in the National Archives of Washington, D.C. When Donald Trump says he prefers people who weren't captured, what he's meaning is he prefers people unlike McCain who were captured and divulged secrets and went against our country. And, you know, as that video said, as that audio clip said of John McCain, he said, He'll never forget how good the Vietnamese were to him. So perhaps he is, like many say, the true Manchurian captain. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel. Catch me on these alternate media sources.